I make music for computers. So it's kind of ap apropos that I would follow Michelle pondering kind of the use of computers in making art. Uh, and I consider the laptop to be my instrument. Now I expect in a room this size there's probably at least one person who's maybe skeptical of the idea that the laptop computer could ever be considered a musical instrument. Don't worry, I won't ask you to raise your hand or anything like that. Uh, but if you, let me see if I can explain my reasoning in my talk here today before giving a little performance here for you. The laptop computer is what enables me to use any sound and use it as material in my creative work. Any sound, that's a big promise, right? Uh, but for me, it frames the laptop music properly, pointing away from the technological tools and toward the material with which we work, sound. Okay. True, I need a microphone to capture sound. I need headphones or loudspeakers to hear that sound again. But it's the laptop that I keep coming back to that allows me to explore the sound, to segment the sound, repeat the sound, uh, craft the sound, and, and just play with it and create new music. Uh, now, I'm someone who likes to look back at history, and I have time here today just to try to, uh, I like to trace trends back to the individuals and the ideas that kind of sparked this idea. And maybe it's some, some sort of neuroses as an electronic musician. We're constantly fighting this idea that this is something brand new and fantastic and always on the cutting edge. I'm someone who likes to look back and kind of trace ideas back to their origins. Uh, and I want to highlight just two people here today that have influenced my thinking on this matter of the idea of any sound being of something of potential. The first person is John Cage. Uh, 2012 marks actually the centennial of John Cage's birth, and so there's a lot being written and talked about him uh, currently. Uh, Cage was an American composer who not only wrote provocative music, but also said a lot of provocative things. Uh, and you can see some of that. He, I think, rather enjoyed that, that role as provocateur, uh, and that came across in a lot of the images of him. But because he said a lot of provocative things, there's a lot of artists, not just in music, that trace their aesthetic thinking back to something that John Cage said. So why would you be surprised that I'm any different than most artists th these days? Um, in 1937, Cage delivered a talk in Seattle, Washington, to the local art society. They didn't have TED Talks back then in 1937. Uh, and eventually, that talk would become known as the Future of Music Credo, which I think is a very appropriate title because there's, it's packed with ideas that would see themselves come to fruition in subsequent decades. One specific idea is that he imagined electronic instruments that would, quote, make available for musical purposes any and all sounds that can be heard. Or in other words, any sound is available for musical purposes. In 1957, 20 years after Cage's remarks, a young engineer at Bell Labs by the name of Max Matthews programmed a 17-second composition and rendered it into sound using the IBM mainframe computer. And music and computers have been linked ever since. In subsequent years, uh, Max would become known as the father of computer music, uh, although he was very fond of saying that he was just simply in the right place at the right time, which I think is a, is a good metaphor for kind of how some of these ideas spread, just being in the right place at the right time and doing the right thing that kind of changes things. Uh, and in his later years, he, I mean, even he made a habit of uh, uh, attending conferences of electronic music and still connecting with what people were doing in this field of computer music. And this is one example of this where I, I got a chance to meet him for the second time briefly at a conference uh, in uh, January 2011, just a few months before he passed away. Uh, and you can see uh, the, the smiling faces of some of my students as we got to gather around really the kind of the father of our discipline, the father of computer music. Uh, but Turning sound into digital information, I believe, is the key to unlocking Cage's vision of any sound becoming musical material. And I certainly hear echoes of Cage's hyperbole in what Matthews wrote in 1963 when he said, the numbers which a modern digital computer creates can be directly converted into sound waves. The process is completely general, and any perceivable sound, there it is again, can be so produced. Or in other words, any sound can be produced by computers. So I keep coming back to this refrain of any sound. And because it's such an important issue for computer music, one of the things that we keep coming back to is, well, if any sound is, poten is potentially available for us to use as a material in making music, where do I start? You, you could immediately see the potential here to, to freeze up and, and collapse under the weight of such a big promise and an open field. But I find it exciting. It's something that stimulates my work. But it's always one of the first questions that I have to come back to when creating something new is, where do I start? Okay? Most of the time when I perform on laptop, I'm not actually doing it alone. Um, in 2004, my colleague at Stetson University founded this group called Mobile Performance Group, or MPG for short. 
he founded it as an idea of uh, bringing together our students. Uh, he's a visual artist, does a lot of stuff with video performance. I'm a mus computer musician. I do a lot of stuff with music performance. Uh, he had the idea that we could, with our students, create these audiovisual performances and go out and do these things in public spaces, uh, which is not something that usually happens right, in street performance, right? Audiovisual performance with lots of laptops and technology. But for us, answering the question of any sound is something that is always connected to place. We go out usually two days before our performance and we collect sounds. So we've got an image here from San Jose, we've got an image from Indianapolis, we've got an image from Miami, Florida, where we're out kind of scouring the city, finding things that sound interesting. And I'll talk about, primarily about the music side of things because that's, that's what I do with being the music director. Uh, his students do something similar with the visual, taking pictures of things. And then we go back to the hotel and we edit our material down and then we challenge ourselves to limit the performance only using that material that we've captured from that location. Only using that material that we've captured from that city, that place, and using it to create something new. We then go back out into public, using our computers again, and we do a kind of street performance, an audiovisual street performance. And you can see myself and Matt up in the upper right-hand corner there uh, doing a performance uh, with our students, some of our students in these other pictures as well. Usually Matt's the one behind the picture. That's why I, I had to search for one to actually get a, one of him, of him in the shot there, basically. Uh, but it's really interesting what happens when you do this, because most of the times this avant-garde electronic contemporary art is something that happens in these closed spaces, much like this auditorium, right, where the, the select invited audience is uh, here to kind of experience the work, right? Although we can extend that, that through our uh, video cameras. Hi. Thank you for watching at home, right? Uh, but the idea of taking that contemporary art out into public, I think, encourages new experiences and new ways of interacting with art. I mean, there, there's a much different experience when you buy a ticket and you go to a show, right? As opposed to when you're strolling down the street and you just happen to uh, stumble upon this avant-garde audiovisual performance. Uh, and we kind of take our cues from the street, kind of potentially working with uh, beat-driven music, okay? Um, so again, this refrain of any sound is something that I keep coming back to. Um, when I lose track of the why, and I, I, I put this in specifically because I'm in the middle of my Fulbright project right now. I'm doing a lot of programming work, not making much sound, not making much music. But the thing that I reflect on, the thing that keeps me going, is this promise of any sound, using any sound and turning it into music, seeing the potential in a sound as musical material, okay? Uh, today I'd like to perform a small piece for you, uh, so I'm gonna transition back over here to my laptop, uh, and we'll uh, see how this goes. As I perform a new work for you, this is something that I've created especially for today. I'm using just four sound samples, uh, but you can see how I can make, uh, create a small musical performance here using any sound. 